Um, I guess we're all sort of getting a little used to that. I, I taught for a couple hours earlier today, uh, remotely to one of my classes. And uh, it's okay, it's better than nothing. And, and in some ways it's opened the doors to be able to uh, get places and listen to things that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and you're just seeing more and more of these opportunities out there. So I thank you for taking the time to take this opportunity tonight to learn a little bit more about New Jersey's climate, um, climate change, and with a focus on coastal climate. In New Jersey, some people say every part of Jersey is a coastal area. Not exactly, but we are influenced statewide uh, by that big body of water that sits off to our east. Um, and we'll talk about that over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, you'll see photographs on introductory slides that I've pulled off wonderful video of the reserve. Uh, I think one of the slides was off of the uh, Tuckerton Research Group at, uh, at Rutgers as, as well. So for instance, this is one of the first ones. This is a little bit of an outline. Don't worry, you won't be all, here all night and there is no exam at the end. Um, but this gives you a little flavor of where we'll be going. Um, first, I'm gonna tell you a little about the State Climate Office. One slide on the global climate system. Talk about New Jersey's weather and climate in general. What makes New Jersey's weather and climate, New Jersey's weather and climate. A little bit about climate change, past, present, and yeah, future. Um, and the impacts and potential actions. I think I have a question mark next to the future on a couple of the slides. Sometimes I keep it on, sometimes off. And then a little bit towards the end on impacts, potential actions, kind of a like, so what? Or why does it matter? sort of thing. But that's more in the social science realm of things um, than in the physical science. But I have a few thoughts I'll convey at the end about that. Uh, first of all, greetings from the State Climate Office. State Climate Office is at Rutgers University, part of the land-grant institution. Uh, the state climatologist, who has been me for the last 29 years, um, is appointed by the Dean of the Ag Experiment Station. It used to be Cook College as well, the Dean, a multiple seating for this Dean. Now it's the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. Uh, this appointment is via decree of Governor Byrne back in the late 1970s, uh, when the state climate offices around the nation transitioned from a federal position in the 50s, 60s, early 70s. They abolished it and the land grant universities primarily picked it up in the late 70s and uh, owe a lot to the people who had the, the resolve to bring it in, up to the, uh, to the uh, land grant level. Some, some state agencies, environmental agencies, house the state climate office, but primarily state climatologists around the country in every state, but Tennessee and Massachusetts has an active state climate office. Um, they're mostly at the state university level and, and oftentimes professors as well as state climatologists. Some states have just a full-time state climatologist. Um, frankly, I'm a full-time state climatologist who also works full-time as a professor, uh, but we won't count the hours. Uh, this is our website, njclimate.org. Um, we're here to help people make decisions, whether it's those of you listening who have a question about the current weather, because we have a weather network around the state that updates its conditions every five minutes, or you might have a, a more general question about something. Today, I had a medical doctor ask for information on the number of thunderstorms in North Jersey, I think it was the last 20 years. He says, you can't find it on your website. That's because there are no lists like that. I'm going to have to direct them to a site um, with data from Newark Airport, where we do have long-term records of thunderstorms. But that's it for North Jersey. But that's why we're here. We know this, and we can help these people. I assume he's doing some kind of interesting study, uh, and I'm fascinated to know. Um, but we work with every state agency you can name, emergency management, agriculture, transportation, environmental protection, 
Um, we work with throughout the private sector, um, again, with individuals, with educational organizations, and a kind of the credo of state climatologists is locals trusting locals. That doesn't mean you should mistrust those at the regional climate center uh, up at Cornell or at the national climate center, uh, which is down in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, we work with them all the time as state climatologists, but when it gets to the nitty gritty of what you wanna know about your state, um, we know more than those people. We know where to go get the data. We know the lay of the land. Uh, we know the people. I happen to be a native of New Jersey, so I grew up and was weaned on the weather uh, and climate of New Jersey. Um, we have all sorts of information for you. These are on our website. These graphs show you the last 12 months of departures from normal of precipitation in the top left and temperature in the bottom right. If on the top left, the bar is green, that's above average precipitation for that particular month. And the y-axis you can see is in inches, each of those horizontal lines. So we've had four hefty months of precipitation in the last 12. And we've had four that have been an inch or more below average. A um, little bit more leaning, and then we've had a few that have been so darn close, three that are within spitting distance of average. Average being 1981 to 2010, that 30 year period serves as a baseline average. Actually, after this year, they'll be updating the averages to 1991 to 2020, and they being the national center. Um, the bottom right, temperature anomalies for the last 12 months. Red bars have been above normal, blue bars below normal, and you can see warmth is dominated. Um, we annotate it when we get something in the top 10, and you can see one, two, three, four, five, six of the last 12 months have ranked amongst the 10 warmest on record, and that period of record goes back to 1895 when state records began to be kept on a monthly basis. So warm we have been. We had the seventh warmest winter, December through February uh, last winter, and we had the second warmest summer on record. Um, just 2010 beat us out. Um, we've been very warm, but we had a couple cool months. April and May were cool. Um, first time we had back-to-back -back below normal months since 2017 into early 2018, December, January 2017, 2018. Uh, we've been cooking in Jersey, and these are on the, the page just to uh, illustrate that. Uh, and they're used by many people, particularly the precipitation graph, and particularly when we get into drought conditions. Uh, Department of Environmental Protection always is asking me for updates of this, and we, we do it monthly now, but we can extend it out over any period of time you wish. Um, we have a weather network I mentioned. Um, this is 65 stations, literally from West Cape May to High Point Monument, where we gather data of multiple weather variables. We gathered via cellular transmission every five minutes and immediately display it in tabular uh, and map form. Each station has its own web page, so you can look at conditions on that web page, and it accompanies a National Weather Service forecast as well for the next week. Um, this is visited and visited and visited, and it's called a mesonet. We call it the Rutgers, New Jersey Weather Network, but the more generic term is a mesonet. In other words, it's, it's more, more densely populated with stations than, say, National Weather Service airport stations, which dot portions of the state and the nation. Um, and it's not a micro network where you'd have maybe a dozen stations in a, in a city. So it's the meso in between. And there's about 30 mesonets around the country. Um, Delaware has a mesonet. You can see some of the data uh, displayed here from the Delaware mesonet. They even cover Chester County, Pennsylvania, because the Brandywine Creek, which supplies water to northern Delaware, begins in Pennsylvania. So they're interested in knowing how much rain is falling out of state and flowing into their state. New York has a mesonet, Pennsylvania is beginning to develop one. Our four states we've met annually for the last couple of years just to share notes, exchange information, um, 
and, and we have the state climatologists have uh, a mesonet program of about 20 net networks affiliated with state climate offices and so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's at that break point between weather and climate. Whatever we're displaying right now from one of these stations is the weather. And that information literally gets fed into National Weather Service forecast models. It goes right to the National Weather Service and makes more precise weather forecasts. The more, the better the data you put into those models, the better the outlook you get, the better forecast you get. Um, so we provide that to the Weather Service and we get some funding for the network through that. This network is not supported by Rutgers University, um, except the fact that as state climatologists, I get a portion of my support as state climatologists and I have an assistant state climatologist, but we handle far more than this network. Otherwise, I employ a half dozen people who job full or part-time is to maintain the stations out in the field. I have two IT people that keep things humming in the cloud now with most of our data and, and with polling the stations and so on. This happens to be our best coastal station uh, at the National Guard and State Police Training Facility at Seagirt. Literally, you're looking behind that station at the dunes. Um, massive dune field, a natural dune field there along the coast. Wind is measured 10 feet, 10 meters, excuse me, above the ground. And down near the surface, we have measure rain and we have arms off the tower where temperature, humidity, um, and, and, uh, and solar incoming solar radiation are measured amongst other variables. We also have a volunteer program. I don't know if anyone's on it right now, it is a Coco Raz observer. Uh, but the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network is part of a national network. Um, our state climate office manages or operates um, the New Jersey network. We have about 300 active citizen science observers. Um, and in any given rainstorm, about 260 of them will go out in this standard rain gauge, costs about $30. Um, they put it on a post and they go out and they read their rain gauge and they get online on their computer or on their iPhone or Android cell phone and they enter the precipitation for the last 24 hours, generally between about 6 or 8 a.m. And it goes into a national database, the National Archive, and it really helps to supplement our, vol our, our automated network and Unlike the automated network, we get snowfall measurements from many of these observers. Here are two maps we generate in our office of 24-hour rainfall totals just in the past month, um, September 10th, when we had a lot of localized heavy storms. You can see the coast really had a lot of rain. Anything in purple is getting over, up to or over two inches of rain. A little bit up here in the Northwest too. Not much up near High Point, and it was a little bit low in the western, southwest too. Now this event happened just a week ago, and this, the coast was spared the heaviest of the rain, but a huge swath of rain, upwards of two to four inches, went right up through uh, the state. So this shows you why we need so many observers, because the rainfall varies so much from one place to another. And it's so important for flood forecasting. If it doesn't rain, we went 17 days in September with hardly any rain in North and Central Jersey. Uh, for drought conditions, um, it's used for environmental monitoring. Um, it's so many different utility um, sources of information use um, our, our uh, precipitation data. So wonderful, wonderful citizen science program. If you're interested, it's cocoraz.org and it'll show you how you can sign up, um, where you can go to purchase a gauge and all sorts of online training materials. I catch my breath and see if there are any questions about the state climate office and, and how we operate. All right, so again, if you do have a question, uh, either place it in the chat or uh, you can use one of the uh, hand raising features uh, or notifications and I'll 
I'll uh, call on you. So if there's any questions so far, go ahead. There will be other opportunities. Oh, yep, absolutely. All right, let's. I don't see my hand raised. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm not seeing it tonight. Um, I was. Just, could you tell me the name again of the? Um, I know you said the micro, the meso, and what is the other one that's in the cities called? Well, that would be a micro network where you have. There's a micro network in New York City. So City College in New York has it, where they have a dozen or two dozen stations all throughout the five boroughs. Uh, that's pretty densely populated, a number of weather stations. Um, our network is the second densely, most densely populated state network in the country. Delaware beats us. Um, my joke is in Delaware, you know, you can see the next station. There's like 40 of them and the state's so small. That's one prerequisite. You have to put a station in where you can see the previous station. Uh, it's not quite like that, but... Uh, That's where I am. I'm in Delaware, so... <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll pick on Delaware. I'm okay with Delaware jokes. <laughs> yeah, my, son's building, my son's building a home in Delaware. He's escaping New Jersey because your property taxes are 20% of what they are here. Uh, anyway, no, Delaware, wonderful state climate office. One of my closest friends in the world is the state climatologist of Delaware. Um, Dr. Dan Leathers, who's a professor in the Department of Geography at University of Delaware. Um, and they have a wonderful network. He oversees it. And uh, the assistant, Kevin Brinson, actually, he runs the day-to-day -day in the network now. Um, but Dan passed on to him. But wonderful network in Delaware. And, and I might add, better funded through the state and other sources than our network. Um, it's just a little easier in Delaware. It, everything is one-tenth of New Jersey. And I think that includes bureaucracy and getting in the doors of people who can fund things. So, no, no. Lo Delaware, terrific state, terrific network. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Any other questions before we uh, move on? And anybody can join Coco Ross, right? Uh, anybody, we've had, there's a high school junior now. She joined with her folks when she was seven or eight years oh, old. Cool. Um, and we have octogenarians. We have all ages, um, all backgrounds. You just have, some people do it as a civic duty of sorts. Others are what we call weather geeks or more affectionately weather weenies. Um, <laughs> And, and they just love going out, monitoring, sharing the data. Um, you can go on that site and look, there's 15,000 observers around the nation and some in Southern Canada and in the Bahamas, actually. Oh, and wow. you can see, for instance, you can go online Saturday and, and see how much rain falls um, from Delta in Louisiana, right. or you can go back last month and see how much fell from Laura, or you can go back last month and see how much Sally deposited in uh, the Florida Panhandle and Southern Alabama. There are multiple totals over 20 inches from that. Um, mind you, New Jersey gets about 45 to 50 inches of rain a year. So that's about half a year rainfall almost from that one storm, if you were to bring it up here. Wow. Um, All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's it. So I'll let you continue. Global climate system. One slide. All in one slide. It's complicated. This isn't a cop out why we don't have perfect weather forecasts. And I can't tell you what this winter is going to be like with any level of specificity. But it's what makes it so interesting and exciting. It's all these spheres put together. The atmosphere which we know very well with its gaseous and, and particulate matter con constituents. Uh, we certainly know the particulate matter in the last couple of months with the smoke from the Western fires that's been drifting across the country. Um, and I hear about daily from Kokoraz Central, which is out of Colorado State. I know those folks very well where Kokoraz began. And just today, the air quality again in Fort Collins, Colorado is horrible because of a forest fire up in the snowy mountains of, Wa of Wyoming. I have a, a close friend who's out in Oregon State University. They were just choked 
last month for 10, 12 days. They didn't see the sun from the smoke, the particulate matter in the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is a big player. Um, the hydrosphere, 70% of the Earth's covered by ocean and, and lake water. Um, with that, in, And then we've got rivers flowing. We have atmospheric moisture. We have a lot of water locked up in ice sheets and glaciers. Um, the lithosphere, um, it grows mountains, which influence the local weather and climate and also can influence circulation patterns across the globe um, as they interfere with the air masses that glide across the, in the atmosphere. Or they could, could be a volcanic eruption, such as Pinatubo in 1991, which gave New Jersey a cooler than what would have been expected 1992 because of the particulate matter and the gases that it put up into the stratosphere well above the day-to-day -day weather that reflected some of that solar energy back out to space and it didn't go to heat the atmosphere and the oceans and the land surface and speaking of the land surface we have two players here besides elevation it's the biosphere desert forest field now some of them are dictated by weather patterns but they in turn can dictate weather patterns so again, all part of that ongoing exchange. And then fine, oh, I didn't say cryosphere, my favorite. Uh, the cryosphere, I did mention glaciers um, and ice sheets and, and sea ice and snow cover. In truth, full disclosure, my international research for my entire career, going back to grad school, is in snow cover, um, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere on land, but also over over sea ice. Um, and I've done some work with sea ice and a little bit with ice sheets. Um, so that's been my, outside of New Jersey, I'm known as a snowman. Um, and uh, I've had a wonderful career um, studying that. Um, so just the multiple hats we all wear. Uh, but now front and center here is another sphere of sorts and that's human activities. Uh, our urban centers, the combustion of fossil fuels, um, deforestation, changing f grasslands into agricultural lands and so on and so forth. It is a player, as we will see, in this whole climate system. So it's wonderful, it's fascinating. It, there's opens doors for chemists, biologists, physicists, computer programmers, statisticians, geographer, geolo geographers, geologists, you name it, to study the physical components of this system, let alone hand off decisions we have to make about how we're going to treat our climate system, which gets into the humanities and the social sciences as well. So it's, it's an interesting time to be a climatologist. I, I like to kiddingly say, that when I started this 40 years ago, people thought a climatologist mixed drinks or something like that. Uh, what was a climatologist? Now everybody knows what a climatologist is uh, and does. And sometimes I, uh, I long for the time where there was more anonymity because I've had to become a political scientist at time, times as well as a physical scientist. But I'm here tonight to talk physical science to help you gain a better understanding of the climate system and what's going on, and particularly as we get to coastal climates of our great state. And Delaware, too. Um, so let's go on New Jersey's weather and climate. Um, it's dictated by a lot of factors. Yes, it's in the middle latitudes. It's mostly affected by westerly winds that come into the state. It, it's a battle zone between polar air to the north and subtropical air to the south. And it's always battling it out here in the middle latitudes, which makes our weather so variable day to day and week to week. Um, and given we're in the middle latitudes, we have pronounced seasonal transitions. Uh, we get very warm in the summer, we get quite cold in the winter. You go further north, they don't get that warm in the summer and they're brutally cold in the winter. You go further south, as you know, you just don't get that cold. So we're in that squeeze play or battle zone 
uh, which makes our weather so variable, so interesting, and difficult, difficult to forecast, either in the short term for weather or in the long term for seasonal climate predictions. Um, there's a little more credibility when we'll talk about longer term climate change over decades into the future. Um, we have a little bit better handle on that. Um, and locally, our climate's influenced within New Jersey by altitude, latitude, We've got a couple, two degrees of latitude. Think about it. Cape May is about the same latitude of Washington Baltimore corridor and high points, northern Pennsylvania and southern New England. Um, altitude, it's sea level to 1,803 feet, but it can make a difference at the higher uh, elevations. They tend to be windier, they tend to be colder overall, uh, snowier, and even rainier because as the air comes off the ocean, it gets lifted by running into these hills, dare I say mountains, and that helps the moisture condense for more rain. So the rainiest part of the state is up here in the highlands that gets over a foot more rain a year, over 50 inches, than down here along the southern coast, which gets about 40 inches of rain a year, rain and melted snow. Um, we have surface conditions. We have urban areas, particularly through this central or Piedmont area, um, with pavement and rooftops and chimneys belching out heat. The pavement and rooftops absorb solar radiation more than a forest or a field, and they heat up, um, so on and so forth. So we have local, mic those would be considered micro or urban climates, urban heat islands. Um, the Pinelands, um, a very unique climate of forests, but also sandy soils. So they tend to heat up a lot during the day and cool off at night. And then the, uh, the, the agricultural area to the south, low elevation, a little further south and a little away from the ocean, that tends to be the warmest spot in the state. And then the wonderful coastline, our, our maritime climate that is so inextricably linked to what's going on offshore in the Atlantic. And you can, if you wish, sw swing that around and bring it into some of the lower parts of Delaware Bay as well. But let's just kind of focus on the coastal climate, uh, the Atlantic coastal climate here, where water is the great modifier or moderator. Uh, it's slow to heat up, it has a high heat capacity. So it's slow to heat up and it's slow to cool off and it doesn't get too cold and it doesn't get too hot. So it keeps the maritime climate of coastal New Jersey more moderate uh, than inland. Doesn't mean you can't get down near the zero degree Fahrenheit mark in very rare conditions if a lot of cold air is just blowing down quickly out of the Northwest, or it can get up into the 90s as it did a few times this summer when you keep the winds blowing in from the West and don't allow a sea breeze to develop. But this next one shows you the effects of the cooler water offshore. This is extreme. There was a heat wave early in April and temperatures were near 90 inland. Yet, if you've ever tipped your toe in the ocean in early April, it's anything but warm. And when the air on, on land warmed up and started rising, being less dense than the cold air, the air from the ocean atop that was modified by the underlying colder waters of the ocean started moving inland. And here it was 50 at our Harvey Cedars and sea, Seaside Heights stations. And here in central Burlington County, 90 degrees, down in Sicklerville and Camden County, 90 degrees, 40 degree range in temperature at this mid-afternoon period of time. That's extreme. Um, but we see this in the summer where a sea breeze can knock temperatures down 10 or 15 degrees from the low 90s to the upper 70s along the coast. Um, so it, it is a great moderator. You have to be very patient in the spring as you wait for spring to, ar uh, to arrive. I always say, go to the coast and look for forsythia because that's the last place you'll see them bloom in New Jersey in, in the spring. But on the other hand, you may have to wait till Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving to have a frost kill your flowers. Um, it, there's a, a, a big, big difference. So 
coastal climate, the great moderator temperature wise. <sighs> coastal climate, uh, it does get affected not only by heavy rains, not only by strong winds, but storm surges brought upon by hurricanes, or for that matter, uh, hybrid storms like a Sandy or a nor'easter. And here you can see the more, most destructive hurricane uh, of the last century uh, uh, along the Jersey coast. This storm paralleled the Jersey coast. It never made landfall. It was six years after the great um, New England, Southern New England hurricane of 38 that killed 600 people on Eastern Long Island and Southeastern New England. It gave New Jersey a lot of rain, but we were far enough west, we escaped the storm surge and heavy, uh, heavy uh, strong winds. But the 44 hurricane was sure close enough that if you put these photographs in color, you might think you were looking at Sandy photographs from 2012. Stay tuned. Um, the, nor the greatest nor'easter damage wise of the 20th century and since was the nor'easter of March 1962. It's often called the Ash Wednesday storm, but it lasted several days. That was the problem. The storm stalled off the Jersey coast, the mid-Atlantic coast, and the high tide after high tide came ashore. And before the next high tide would uh, come in, the, the low tide hadn't receded much. So you kept each high tide got successively higher. And again, you split Long Beach Island in several spots, including here in Harvey Cedars. That's Long Beach Island at high tide. Um, very, very destructive storm. For Long Beach Island, this was more destructive by many, by absolutely more destructive than Sandy. When you went further north, Sandy was more destructive. South of LBI, the 62 storm was more destructive as well, but it really seemed to have eyes on LBI in particular in 62. Um, oh, it snows too along the coast. Yes, it, it tends to moderate things and there get less snow along the coast, but if it's cold enough and the storm gets just close enough, you can be dumped on along the coast. This is a perfect example 10 years ago where the storm was far enough off coast that the Delaware Valley didn't get the moisture, got four or five inches of snow. It wasn't because it turned to rain. It wasn't because it wasn't cold enough. They just didn't get the moisture in there. But along eastern half of Jersey got pummeled uh, with, one, with two, two and a half feet of snow up the Garden State Parkway. Uh, it was cold enough and the moisture was there. And the eastern part, a tremendously memorable storm in the Delaware Valley, kind of a ho-hum. What's all the big deal? So the turnpike, not as big a deal till you got up to about Old Bridge and North. Uh, the Garden State Parkway stemmed the stern. It was a very impactful storm. Then Sandy, um, the most transformative climate weather event in New Jersey, certainly in my lifetime, and, and I would say quite clearly within at least the last century. Um, it was a hurricane that morphed with a developing nor'easter into this hybrid storm. It took a very strange path because it couldn't shoot out into the Atlantic because there was what we call a blocking high pressure system out in the North Atlantic. Um, it was a late season hurricane formed in the Western Caribbean, uh, not unlike Delta, um, and headed up the uh, East Coast, not to go out to sea, but to make a left turn and make landfall at Absecon, just north of Atlantic City, just after being declassified as a hurricane and called a post-tropical cyclone. So it never technically made landfall as a hurricane. Um, in New Jersey, but it morphed into a huge storm, just like Delta it was a very compact storm in the Western Caribbean when it hit the Yucatan. And now it's morphing into a bigger storm, but it's purely tropical. This morphed into even a bigger storm where the cloud field from Sandy at one point stretched from Southern Greenland to Georgia, from well out in the Atlantic to Chicago and Milwaukee. That's how big a storm it was. And Jersey was dead center 
in the, in the midst of, of this storm. And here we had a breach at the northern end of Barnegat Bay, um, a breach where a number of houses were eliminated and the ocean met the bay. This is the southern end of LBI. Uh, LBI did not escape this storm by any means. Uh, one of my students and his buddy, who's on the car there, foolishly rode out this storm with two feet of water in their one-story house, um, almost went up on the roof of the house for fear that the house would fill with water. Bad, bad decision that he admitted he would never make again. Um, but, you know, youth, youth. Um, so a lot of a tremendous damage from Sandy. And it wasn't just the barrier islands and peninsulas. It was the mainland, areas of Tucker, and the forgotten areas of our bays um, that just suffered greatly. And to this day, some people have not returned to their homes. As I said, a, a transformative event, not just physically in New Jersey, but in so many other ways. Um, questions about the overall weather and climate of Jersey, because I'm looking at the clock. I got to speed things up a little if you're going to get out of here. Any questions? Do you want to save until the next question round if you want to sure. move in? Okay. I will journey on. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Well, now we'll get into the climate change aspect that might be why some of you tuned in this evening. Let's cut right to the chase. The Earth's climate is changing. It's happening right now. It's affecting New Jersey. Okay, so the climate's changing. There's one thing left out of this statement, and that is, why? Well, here we go on. And humans are responsible for a significant portion of recent changes. Okay, let me take those qualifiers. Significant. Depends what variable you're talking about, depends what part of the world you're talking about, and it depends which climatologist you're talking to. Um, I, generally, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change feels it's 90% or greater chance that humans are mainly responsible for changes seen in the last four to five decades. Up till that point, a signal of natural climate variability uh, masked the human changes, but the anthropogenic or human signal of climate change emerged from the natural variability in the late 70s, early 80s, and has become more and more apparent. You cannot explain the warmth of the earth today, the increased moisture in the atmosphere, some of the extreme weather events. You cannot explain it with purely natural fluctuations. And this has been shown time again and again by statistical analyses of observations. It's been shown by climate models, which are the same physics of weather forecast um, models, which you may say they're not good. They're darn good um, in this day and age. They're run a little differently, but they're models. And then there's simple theory the, of the greenhouse effect. You put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they tend to throw a blanket on the bed. The atmosphere naturally is, is a blanket that keeps some of the solar energy closer to the Earth's um, surface um, before it escapes out into space. Um, but it's, if you're cold at night, you put a blanket on. And if you're still cold, you put another blanket on. And it doesn't mean that you trap that heat permanently near your body, otherwise you might self-combust. Um, but it slows the it delays the departure of that heat from near your body. Of course, your body's producing the heat. In the case of, of Earth, the sunlight is warming the oceans and the sunlight's warming the land. And it's trying to get out to balance what came in. But it stays in a little longer. And if you add another blanket, add more greenhouse gases, you'll keep it in even a little bit longer. So people say it traps the heat. I like to say it delays the heat. It keeps the heat closer to Earth longer. Eventually that heat is going to escape, but it's gonna leave it warmer under, within and under the blanket. And that's what humans are doing by changing atmospheric greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. 
they in turn are adding that thin blanket. When you warm the atmosphere, it, a warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor, more water in vapor form. Vapor is by far the most pervasive greenhouse gas. We don't add a lot directly in terms of water vapor, we humans, but indirectly by increasing the trace gases, the carbon dioxide and methane, we warm the atmosphere, which allows more water vapor to be held in the atmosphere, which increases the greenhouse gas, uh, the greenhouse effect further. Uh, we also had a lot of dust and smoke, and some of that actually cools, counterbalances some of the greenhouse warming. If we didn't have more dust in the atmosphere from plowing fields and from unnatural forest fires, more abundant forest fires, the earth would even have warmed faster than it has. So there's a little bit of counterbalance, but, but the warming totally outpaces the uh, any cooling effects from human activities. And then we're also affecting our landscape. This is effects of deforestation, where you change your land atmosphere boundary tremendously between heavily vegetated forests and lightly vegetated or non-vegetated fields and, and, and such. So a lot of impacts on, um, on our climate system caused by humans. There are natural fluctuations in the sun, albeit minor. There are those occasional vol volcanic eruptions, but they do not come close to explaining this. This is an increase in the heat content of the ocean and the heat in the atmosphere over the last 60 years or so. Uh, and you can see the oceans hold most of the heat that's come from increasing greenhouse gases. Yes, the atmosphere is warmed, and you can see it here, um, but the most of the heat is being held, thank you, by the oceans, by the shallow oceans and the deeper parts of the ocean. Uh, over 90% of the heat that has been held in by the gre increasing greenhouse gases has gone into the oceans to warm the oceans. Some of it has warmed the atmosphere, um, but the majority has gone into the oceans. So our oceans are getting warmer and warmer, not just at shallow depths, but at deeper depths as well. New Jersey, this is atmospheric temperatures in New Jersey since 1895 up to 2019. Simple linear regression, New Jersey is warming about three degrees per century Fahrenheit. Uh, in this case. And you can see that the cooler years of the last couple of decades are equivalent to the warmer years of most of the 20th century. We just don't get cool anymore. But we do have interannual fluctuations in temperature. Some years are warmer, um, 2012 being the warmest. Um, and we occasionally get a little bit cooler uh, year. Uh, because of the way the jet stream might change on ever, but our cool years are getting warmer and our warm years are getting warmer. And the last couple decades have the essentially all of the warmest years of the last 120, 125 years have been in the last couple of decades. Precipitation. We've got about 5% increase in precipitation over the last century. A um, couple of inches that amounts to. Um, we have a tremendous amount of variability with precipitation. Here's your drought of the mid 1960s. Here's the last time New Jersey had a drought emergency with major water restrictions in 2002. Um, 2012, 2011 with Hurricane Irene, uh, Tropical Storm Irene and other storms was the wettest year on record until 2018. 2018 didn't have any tropical storms. It just frequent, it rained frequently with a large amounts of precipitation and you added it all up and it was the wettest year. So the last decades had the two wettest years in the last 125, 26, but it's had some dry ones too. So look at the variability, look at the interannual variability. More so in the last couple 50 years or so, than the previous 70 years. So we have to be prepared for very wet episodes 
but we still have to be prepared for very dry ones. And that, that I contend that makes it more difficult than if we knew it was all going in one direction or the other. Um, and sea level, bring you down to the coast. These are sea level measurements from Sandy Hook at top and Atlantic City at the bottom. Put it all together, about a 15 inch rise in sea level relative to the coast in the last century. About two thirds of that is caused by the melting of ice sheets, ice that was on land that started filling the ocean and the warming we saw earlier of the ocean. Warm water expands. So you've got this thermal expansion of the waters and a little bit more water. A third of it though is from the fact that New Jersey's coast is sinking a little bit. It's sinking because we're pulling water out of the ground in well fields, but it's also sinking and it has been sinking for the last 20,000 years since the ice sheets of North Jersey and New England and New York and Canada melted. When the ice sheets were there, they pressed down on the land to the north and the land like a tube of toothpaste bulged up to the south, and that's South Jersey. And with the ice melting 20,000 years ago, the land's been rising to our north and sinking a little bit along the Jersey coast. These are called ice, uh, isostasy, isostatic adjustment. And that will continue on in the future, but it's beginning to be dwarfed by the rate at which sea level is rising. So that will be a small part of the equation 50 years from now. Now it's about a quarter to a third of the equation when we're talking about sea level rise over the last century. So let's cut to the chase here. What's the future hold? I like to say the train has left the station. New Jersey is going to continue to get warmer. We're still burning fossil fuels. We're not going to stop anytime soon. Hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with a little hope in a few minutes, but right now, ah, doom and gloom. Uh, New Jersey's got to keep getting warmer. Even if we stop burning fossil fuels, we have all that heat sitting in the ocean, all that excess heat, and that would help to warm the atmosphere in the decades ahead. So temperatures are going to keep rising. Hold that for now. Um, models suggest the mid-Atlantic states will stay as wet, if not get wetter in the future. Most of that increased wetness will probably be in the cool part of the year, not in the summer. So summers are going to be hot, Hotter, maybe drier, but probably not wetter. So there's gonna be a lot more evaporation, a lot more strain on our agriculture. Meanwhile, the winters are gonna be milder and wetter. But New Jersey hasn't had a new reservoir built since the early 1980s uh, to hold that water. So that water just gonna run downstream. Some will percolate in the ground for groundwater uses, um, but we're gonna have to be very careful in managing our water in the future. Um, we have more energy in the climate system, warmer lands, particularly warmer oceans, warmer atmosphere. Remember that atmosphere holds more moisture. So we are primed for more extremes, stronger storms. Jury's out on whether we'll have more storms, but those storms are like, that do form are likely to be stronger. We can demonstrably show that Sandy was stronger than it would have been on landfall in New Jersey if not if the sea surface temperatures hadn't been above normal for two consecutive years and had been at normal late October temperatures, Sandy would have been a weaker storm. It would have taken the same track, the, the model runs, post-storm model runs, um, a post-mortem of sorts um, would say, tell you, but it wouldn't have been as strong a storm. Storm surge, wind, and in South Jersey, very heavy rainfall. Um, so we've seen that already. Um, you might say, what a cop-out, Robinson. Flood and drought? Come on. Well, think about it. If you've got more energy in the system and more moisture in the atmosphere, if you can get a trigger to squeeze that moisture out, form the storms, form the, ra the rain. You can have heavier amounts of precipitation. But 
if you don't have that trigger, you've got warmer conditions and warmer conditions evaporate more moisture. They can dry out the land. And when you dry out the land, you put less moisture in the atmosphere and you dry it out further. You have fewer clouds. So the sun shines stronger on the surface and you can dry areas out and get into a drought. So it's a feast or famine sort of thing when you have more energy in the climate system. And then sea level, it, it, it will keep rising. So let's, let's look up a little bit about this. But this one I, I think is very important to take home. And, and it's also important if you happen to run into someone who's a little skeptical about this. Look at this curves, these curves. The one on the left, this is real data, showed the distribution of temperature the frequency of temperatures back in the latter part of the 20th century. And this was general distribution of temperature. Most were within this range, but you had your cold and you had your extreme cold. You had your heat, and you had your extreme heat. Now we've warmed the system. And this is your curve now. It's a little more wide, uh, dispersed, um, but notice that the, the frequency of hot is much greater than it was. The frequency of extreme hot is much greater. But here's the take home. You can still have some cold weather. You don't have nearly as frequent cold and you maybe have gotten rid of extreme cold except in really, really unusual circumstances. But you still have a distribution of weather and climate. It's just that the warm is more common and the cold is less common. It's like loading the dice. Um, you got warm more often on your sides of the die than cold. Um, and so people who say, hey, it snowed or it was cold. It snowed on May 10th this year in New Jersey. It was cold in May. What is this global warming? Well, you can talk about, yeah, we still can get some cold, but the cold is much less frequent than it used to be. And look around the heat is much more common. So this is kind of a, a interesting, with real data, uh, exercise in exhibiting that. So the weather's not gonna be the same every day. Every day is not gonna be warmer than last year on the same date. Every year isn't gonna be warmer than last year. Um, but with these natural climatologic fluctuations, you're still seeing that upward trend. It's like you're, you have natural fluctuations on a higher foundation, a higher base. So again, your warm is warmer and your cold is warmer, but you still have cold on occasion. And major storms, again, we're primed for more storms because more heat in the atmosphere. Sea level. This is a study that came out, I was involved with on camp, mostly Rutgers folks, but other folks from other universities in the state. Um, looking at sea level um, and, and we, first of all, we can't tell you exactly what's going to happen because we don't know emissions scenarios. Are we going to be able to cut down on fossil fuel burning or is it going to be business as usual? So that's why you have different emission levels, low emissions, moderate emissions or high emissions. And these are your estimates of sea level. These are your probabilities. So there's a 95% chance on the low end of by a foot rise of sea level at the end of the century if we have low emissions. That's like the lowest by the end of the century. But there's a 50-50 chance sea level is gonna be almost three feet higher, even with low emissions, and maybe four feet higher with high emissions by the end of this century. Uh, and at the high end, there's a 5% chance, it may only be 5%, of a five foot rise or a nine foot rise. Now, we can also look back, we don't have to wait. 2100 used to seem a long way away till I had grandkids who, you know, are anywhere from four months to a year and a half to do in two months. Um, and, and they're gonna be alive in 2100, God willing. They're gonna be alive. So we've reached a point where 2100 isn't this distant thing it was when I was in grad school in 1980 and these new models were coming out. It was 120 years away. It's only 80 years away now. People living on this earth are going to be here then. Uh, and what will the Jersey coast look like? 
with only a foot rise, some areas will be permanently inundated. Three foot rise, which is quite likely by the end of the century, these areas of seaside heights will be permanently underwater, day and night, high tide, low tide, not just a storm. And with a six foot rise, unlikely as it may be by the end of this century, essentially our barrier islands are gone in New Jersey. They're gone, they're, they're, they're underwater permanently. Um, so there's a sobering statement. Um, you know what, I'm gonna go right through to the end because I don't have too many more slides, Caitlin. Um, there you can see the Tuckerton Research Station, the Rutgers Tuckerton Research Station, old Coast Guard base, wonderful, wonderful research being done by Ken Abel, the former director and others. Definitely don't miss Ken's talk, he's great. Um, I know a little bit about his book. I provided some information to him as he was working on the book. Um, I, I, I want this, maybe Caitlin can make these slides available to you folks if you're interested or write me if you'd like the slides. I, I don't want to take a lot of time explaining this, but this is from the World Economic Forum, not from climatologists. And they rank every year um, all sorts of events, natural and human-induced events, and they, they graph them based on their impact they would have if they occurred from low to high and the likelihood of them happening from low to high. So high impact, low likelihood is uh, a nuclear holocaust, weapons of mass destruction. But what has high impact and high likelihood, you ask? I think you know, or I wouldn't show this. Extreme weather events and failure of climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and natural disasters. High impact, high likelihood as we look into the future. So if there's a reason why you're here tonight, the reason why you're interested in this subject, this is a pretty darn good justification for that. I think you're all aware of the potential impacts and the ongoing impacts of climate change globally and in particular in New, Jer New Jersey. With sea level rising, it's impacting our coastal areas. We need more beach renourishment. We're worried about our back bays and wetlands and the species that inhabit them permanently or with the birds flying through temporarily. Water resources, uh, forest impacts in our pinelands, um, agricultural impacts, health impacts throughout coastal areas, uh, infectious disease, um, and, and so on and so forth. These are occurring already in different parts of the world and in New Jersey. Um, and they're going to continue to be prevalent and, and, and frankly grow. Um, so what do we do about it? This is the preachy slide. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it. We need to understand things better. Remember I said earlier, I'm here not to talk about the societal side, the economic, the political side of things. I'm here so people can get a better understanding of future climate change. If we can all agree the climate is changing and why it's changing, then we can put all of our energy to trying to figure out how to cope with it. So thank you for attending this evening and I hope it have improved your understanding. This isn't about believing in climate change. I've not used that word tonight. This is not a belief system. This is understanding, being a scientist, appreciating and understanding science. And I don't expect everyone to be a scientist. Most aren't. And most scientists are not climatologists, but you know, build that trust and, and build that understanding so you kind of get it. And you don't have to lean totally on we climatologists um, to, to appreciate what's going on. Mitigation. There are things we can do to slow that train uh, as it's left the station. Um, we can reduce greenhouse gases. We can use cleaner energy. We can use less energy. That's just one example. I'm, I'm going to move right on. We're not going to be able to mitigate ourselves out of this. I've been saying this to my classes for 30 years, even when it wasn't very popular. We're going to have to adapt, and we're learning to adapt. Along the coast, we're adapting now. The question is, 
how long will we be able to sustain that at a adaptability? And I dare say in New Jersey, it's going to be a heck of a long time because we have so much at stake along the coast. We're not going to retreat any faster, probably slower than most any other coastal area in the United States. But let's forget about the U.S. for a minute. Let's look at the global population that lives near sea level. Um, that is far less affluent than the population of the coastal United States. I don't mean to be a downer, but you know, we're going to be talking about not mitigation, but migration in some cases. Some communities have already begun to migrate along, away from coastal areas. In some, particularly up in Alaska, where they're no longer protected along the coast by sea ice and the, and the breaking waves are just pounding and eroding away shorelines. Um, and then finally, we need to be leaders. We need leaders. Uh, we need to be out there. And I'm, you know, I am a climate scientist. I am not an environmental activist. Um, I have my thoughts on all of that, but I'm here as a scientist. But when it all comes down to it, it's just vote. I guess you can say you'd have no right to say anything about things if you don't vote. Look at the platforms of the candidates. If climate change is something you're passionate about, look at that platform. If it's something else, look at that platform and just go out and vote based on your judgment of the candidates and their platforms. That's all I say. If you don't participate and you don't vote, you really shouldn't speak up <laughs> any further. Now, of course, that doesn't mean the youth of the nation of the world shouldn't speak up. Um, but that's that's another story for another time. So let's wrap this up. Um, whoops, I'm not gonna read your words, but I highlighted some. New Jersey's got wonderful, varied climate. Its its climate is changing. It's going to continue to change and that change will likely accelerate with warmth, perhaps precipitation, certainly more variable extremes and sea level rise. And with that, impacts are gonna increase. But here's the hopeful thing. I like to say we were smart enough, we humans, to get ourselves into this mess by developing a combustion engine and you know, things like that. We were smart enough to get us in this, this situation I'm not saying we're going to be smart enough to just wipe the slate clean, but I have to leave some hope that we're going to be able to deal with this situation through human ingenuity uh, and societal actions. Um, it's a tall order. This is one of the biggest problems the globe faces in the, this century. But I'm not going to give up hope that there aren't many, many people out there and many, many people who are coming in the future who are going to help um, to mitigate and, and help us adapt to this. In the meantime, let's keep an eye on things in Jersey. Thanks very much. That was excellent, Dave. Thank you so much. I like your um, analogy of the train left the station. Um, <laughs> we can't, uh, you know, stop it, but we can certainly slow it down. I really like how you said that. Um, so we definitely can take actions to, to do that. So uh, any questions or comments for uh, tonight before we wrap things up? Again, you can put your question in the chat box. Um, you can also, if some people I know weren't, um, the hand raise feature wasn't working. So if you do wanna speak up and ask your question, you can just also take yourself, uh, turn your camera on too, and take yourself off mute to ask your question. So we'll give a, a few minutes. Look at everybody here. I will do a virtual applause. Great job. Thank you so much. That's great information. So different in New Jersey. I, I notice that myself when I'm looking on the, the weather app because I often check whether um, my house sits pretty low. So I'm always looking to see what pre precipitation is going to be like and if my backyard's going to be all soggy and uh, it's, it can be bone dry here, but, you know, uh, 20 miles west of me, they're getting pummeled by rain or vice versa. And, you know, we don't see anything. So it's really interesting, all the, the little micro uh, climates within New Jersey. It's really neat. 
Um, Holly, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I did have a quick question. Um, the, could you give me, I, I feel like I should know this, but the simple answer of what um, definition of a nor'easter, because the things I've looked at, it's it's not written in my simplistic uh, vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do you have kind of a like a quick definition of that? Yeah, it's what we call a, a, a mid-latitude um, cyclone. It's a mid-latitude low pressure system. It's, it's low pressure, which brings rising air and precipitation, strong winds um, can affect ocean levels as well by the wind blowing on them. Uh, it's a clash between cold and warm, warmer air. So the coast is a perfect place for that to happen. As cold air comes off the continent, it runs into the warmer ocean waters and even the Gulf Stream off the coast. And those ingredients can spin up a strong storm system uh, it generally tends to go from south, southwest to northeast up the Atlantic coast. And you may say, well, hold on, that's from the southwest. Why is it called a nor'easter? Well, winds blow counterclockwise around the low pressure system. So as the s storm comes up the, up the coast, the mid-Atlantic coast towards us, the winds, think of that storm offshore rotating counterclockwise, the winds come in from the northeast. Northeasterly winds tell you the direction from which the wind's blowing. So it's from the northeast. So a lot of people used to think, well, if the winds are coming from the northeast, the storm came from the northeast. And you wouldn't believe it, but Ben Franklin figured it out. He had a brother who lived up in Boston and he wrote his brother from Philly saying, we've had this horrible storm and whatever. And his brother wrote back and said, oh, we had it a day later. And Ben's like, you know, the thinking was they should have had it first. And then it came down from the Northeast. And he realized that these weather systems spun counterclockwise and worked their way northeasterly up the coast. So that it's a special kind of low pressure system that is along the Atlantic coast and tends to go up the coast, may form a Cape Hatteras, go up past Jersey, go up into New England, a nor'easter, northeaster or nor'easter. Great, thank you. That was a, I, and I love the uh, historical tie. That's great, thank you. Climatologists tend to like history. And we also <laughs> tend to like baseball for some reason. It's all the numbers, we love the numbers. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Holly, for your question. Anybody else? I've worn you all out. I went, I went longer than I should have. Oh, that was great. You can tell I get a little wrapped up in it. When I, I love the enthusiasm with every everything. I, I, you had me laughing a few times, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, everyone laughs at me. That's fine. <laughs> oh, no. Not laughing at you. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I'm, I'm That's great. I want the enthusiasm. All right, I don't see anything coming through the chat and uh, nobody has themselves coming off mute or showing their cameras. So I'm gonna say that that is all the questions for today. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us again. A lot of great information, a lot of things to think about. Um, so if you have any additional questions, uh, you can always reach out to Dr. Robinson or you can uh, reach out to me, I'll put uh, my email in the chat. If I don't mess it up, I usually do when I do this. All right. Um, so yeah, if you have any other additional questions um, about this talk or about upcoming talks, uh, let us know and enjoy the rest of your evening. Dr. Robinson, thank you again. This was, this was great and very informative. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Be safe. Be well. Thanks. You too. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.